uh so good evening everybody i hope everybody is doing well and keeping safe a uh, very warm welcome to today's session on starting a deep tech startup by cie triple it hyderabad and hetrar uh so as of 2020 we, you know we've had more than uh, 2100 deep tech startups in india and the number is only increasing by the day uh cie at triple uh, it hyderabad has been fostering deep tech startups through its accelerator programs uh and uh, you know called avishkar avishkar brings together the deep tech expertise of triple it hyderabad's research labs and uh, technology mentoring opportunities that help startups build quality products within a very uh, accelerated timeline uh, startups go through structured business mentoring from co creation consulting customer introductions and investor connects for uh, for on rounds of investments uh, i will definitely drop uh, more details on the same on the chat for everybody to explore um, now getting back to the session for the day uh, we're very excited to have two people with immense interest and knowledge in the deep tech sector we have professor ramesh uh, loganathan who heads research innovation at triple it hyderabad he'll be talking to ganapati venugopala who is the co-founder and ceo at axelar ventures vg as he is more popularly known uh, was the head of strategy and planning at infosys prior to co-found at axelar ventures uh, he helps founders build uh, successful businesses and serves uh, also serves on the board of several companies and advisory uh, bodies he is an active writer on issues relating to startups and we look up to him for his insightful views on the startup ecosystem likewise uh, we're looking forward to today's session and uh, where you know these two experts will be talking about uh, starting a deep tech startup uh, so uh, i would like to welcome you both and uh, you know i would like to just uh, give you over the stage so thank you so much and welcome thank you thank, thank you uh, vanya so uh, so we're very happy to be on this session uh, so been a while since we i mean with the pandemic and all travel pretty much switched off uh, so we haven't had a chance to talk much uh, in almost a year now so very happy to be here on this session and a topic very close to both our hearts uh, deep tech startups and uh, and particularly kind of very very relevant in our world uh, at reply uh, which is the seeding of young startups i mean how do deep tech startups Uh, get seeded, get ideated, and what happens in the very early stages. So, so that's what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, and uh, and VG works with uh, almost every startup they uh, invest in, work with, and I'm sure VG helps many other startups. You know, out there of their portfolio uh, are all deep tech startups. Many coming from research, and others even if not from research, uh, using some cutting edge. Not, uh, not all, uh, one fourth of them certainly. One fourth, yes. One fourth. Yeah. So, which is uh, so now that, that is also a problem. Why only one fourth? Because, like, if you look at startups, uh, even our our incubator, if we take the pre incubator also, so we have about hundred uh, odd startups at any given point. Less than twenty twenty five would be startups using technology at a level that even a professor could advise them. I mean, it's not even from research. Even a research level knowledge that might help a startup is less than twenty five percent. So there are not too many startups that use technology at that level today, unfortunately. Yes, they're doing some innovation, no doubt. Uh, they are working, solving a market problem. But our interest is like, how do you build those deep tech uh, solutions? So that's what we're going to be discussing. So let's lay the ground, VG. First, I mean, like in your experience, all these years working with technology, working with technology-based solutions, and specifically uh, tech startups. How do we define a deep tech startup? So let's just put some. I know it's like. Anybody can view it any different ways. What your definition of a deep tech startup? See, um, you know, every business has a certain trajectory. Um, obviously, if you are building out a business, there has to be a customer. There is a real problem of the customer that you are uh, uh, solving with your solution. And uh, over a period of time, uh, the the solution that you have come out with uh, you know is addressing a larger and larger problem and then you are able to expand the relevance of that solution to a large set of customers that's the typical trajectory of most businesses whether deep tech or otherwise in my mind um, the only comp complication or addition that i see uh, for, for a deep tech startup is uh, there are four distinct stages right there is proof of science there is proof of technology proof of business and proof of scale now for most technology startups um i think once they have identified the need they really start at the fag end of proof of technology quickly get on to uh, proof of uh, business 
right? Can it really, uh, is it monetizable? Are customers willing to use, pay for it? And then the focus is entirely on building out a scale, building out scale. The big difference between deep tech startups and most other startups is this, uh, is this mysterious uh, stage of uh, proof of science, right? Now, proof of science is essentially uh, unpredictable, long gestation, and, um, you know, in some sense, you have to build something unique that is that takes time to build, right? So that I think would be the biggest um, um, difference I see among most startups, right? You talked about 100 startups uh, in your in Triple IT incubator, of which 20 or 25 are worthy of even, um, you know, a professor willing to commit time. Uh, most of them would be, would be at, uh, you know, the proof of science, right? The, the, the validation of that, whether it is unique enough, whether the IP is strong, whether it is difficult to build, whether it is defensible, whether the credibility of that is high, right? What people are trying to build. I think that is, uh, that is uh, the big difference. You know, a lot of work that happens in uh, research labs, that happens in institutions, it is possible for us to call them as uh, some bit of uh, scientific work. Uh, but if you really have to convert that into something that will work in real life, that will work in real world, and then on top of it, whatever is working for it to have real impact, right? For it to hit the market, I think that journey is long. Uh, but the proof of science bit and the bar that you have for what you constitute as uh, validation of that science uh, will fundamentally define how deep tech uh, 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 startups. So that's a very nice way of uh, uh, putting it, proof of science. Now, when we talk about startups that are kind of build something and that are looking at validation, if I do know further break that proof of science into a few chunks, most startups are probably in the later stage of proof of science. They're not actively engaged in research. Now, and then they just using some cutting edge uh, work happening knowledge wise, uh, but then the, the the far end of it, very close to technology in terms of what they're using. So those are the ones that will benefit just by talking to a professor as a validation, like you rightly said. Research on the other side, on the other hand, is on the, the beginning edge of that uh, proof of science and very, very far from becoming technology or a product. Uh, they are on that end. Now, how do you see these two, I mean, how do you, I mean, how often do you see that these two converge? I mean, where there is cutting edge research happening, which is classic research, publications, conferences, journals, and such, something new is being done. And then on the other end, a startup using some similar, how do you bridge this gap? See, on the one hand, we have a very uh, romantic notion of uh, scientific discoveries, right? Uh, there is an element of serendipity. There is an element of accident. There is an element of uh, finding a, uh, use case for something that it was not originally intended for, right? And these are all stories that uh, take up a lot of headlines uh, that are very uh, good to narrate as stories. They have a lot of, uh, um, you know, amusement value. Uh, in, in, in some cases, they also could have uh, produced something significant. But I think when we really look at a framework for um, uh, building out deep tech startups, right? Uh, I think we cannot... Uh, uh, entirely depend on uh, serendipity and accidents, right? And in my mind, the, the uh, empirical evidence for technology having been bought out and built out into great startups uh, without the founders having been the originators of that innovation, uh, that has been more successful in corporate large companies buying out technologies than in smaller companies which are founder run. So then essentially we are talking about how can innovators doing some deep research, proprietary research, um, can really build out businesses, right? Uh, I'll give you an example of, uh, you know, one of the most interesting startups I have worked with, right? There's a company from IIT Madras called Detect, hmm. right? Now, Detect started out as a project, a second year project of uh, students who are working on some technology around non-destructive testing. And they were working with Professor Krishnan Balasubramaniam, who's one of the uh, top 10 uh, experts in this field. And, um, and uh, the non-destructive testing lab in IIT Madras also is a very well-known one, right? quite well equipped. What started out as a small um, a kind of student research project, uh, you know, with one IP getting built on top of it, uh, by the time they were in the final year, 
um, it was almost uh, a sensor that could be fitted around the oil and gas pipes uh, right, uh, to detect uh, non-destructively uh, whether the pipe integrity was uh, high, right? Because material defects are very hard to uh, detect in process industries because uh, high temperature, high volume, high throughput fluids are just uh, uh, moving around. And uh, they were lucky enough to um, apply the technology and uh, get a pilot going with uh, Reliance. So the entire time taken uh, from converting something like a non-destructive technology and whatever they had built out, even at a pilot stage, was three times better. It could handle uh, temperatures three times higher than that of a comparable GE product. Right? So I'm sure the professor had a role to play. I'm sure the students were looking at what was getting built. Uh, but the most important thing is in a short span of about 18 to 24 months, what started out as a research project, which could have stayed in the lab, found a real life use case, even though the product was not ready, right? Which started because, uh, you know, given the professor's background, I think uh, there was there was a lot of queries around, can something like this be built, right? So the, the matching of, a potential problem somebody is facing, right? The earlier you put it into your uh, into your uh, development process, uh, the chances of you building something that somebody wants, right? Especially given the uncertainty and the gestation that a typical uh, deep science or a deep tech project has, right? I think having a potential commercial application, a large one at that, in the back of your mind, right? while working on these technologies, um, I think is a useful discipline to build. Wherever it has happened, I know of one other company which was in, uh, which was in uh, material sciences, right? And, um, and they had actually, while they had perfected the science on applying um, some kind of a chemical as a coating on clothes, right? Uh, as a potential antivirus or, a, um, you know, something that could prevent absorption of uh, toxic elements into uh, uh, the skin, right? The, 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 while the science was validated on one side in the lab, uh, the innovator had correspondingly looked at, uh, you know, he had, he had come in from a, a farming uh, family and uh, he knew that the state from which he hailed from uh, the pesticide related cancer was the highest, right? And uh, he noticed that, uh, uh, you know, farmers invariably wrap their face, right? While uh, spraying pesticides. While on the face of it, it seems like a logical one because it prevents uh, the chemical and the, and the fumes and the drops from going inside. The cloth cover actually acts as a good base for absorbing, right? So the essential uh, exposure was much higher than what uh, anybody would have thought. And this always bothered the innovator. So while the science was getting perfected, he was constantly asking himself, can I really use it uh, to give an overall or a cloth uh, which, uh, which uh, people can wear, where the potential pesticide, which is carcinogenic on, on the impact with disintegrates and becomes harmless. Right. Again, uh, the potential use case coming out of the personal background of the innovator embedded very early on into the ideation process. And now when, uh, when uh, Corona hit, COVID hit, they were able to repurpose the same technology for masks. They were able to repurpose the same technology for fabric, apparels, right? especially for uh, healthcare workers. So that I think is a good discipline to have, Ramesh. No, I think uh, this was a fantastic example. I think both these examples, uh, where if you look at the professor's work, probably the professor was not maybe aware of use cases, but was not actively looking for any of those use cases. The, the professor was doing their research work. Very enterprising students came in who started off on the research end of that work, uh, working with the professor, saw the opportunity, kind of connected the dots, and kind of took it all the way, like you said, within 24 months to an actual deployment in a large uh, a group as large as Reliance. And uh, I, I think, but this discovery is the biggest challenge is the way uh, I see 
the research groups by themselves are not either aware of or they are not interested even if they are capable of doing it not interested in finding those use cases so their interest is more research they finish one problem they go on to the next problem so some of them are probably not even their inclination is not attitude or uh, capability also is not there in some cases to spot those possibly other cases the interest is not there those with interest are not connected to research and some of them are connected to research but again they also don't have the ability to so this that science on the research end and the market end uh, are there any via media where it, this also is that the way i look at it like this also is providence that some student there was enterprising kind of came in and decided to work with this professor and then had the kind of um, uh, the aptitude and uh, abilities to spot this use cases and build for it have you seen models of some other models of this happening Not different pla- different different places have uh, adopted different models in in all of them are valuable in different contexts right some institutions have clearly uh, set aside uh, or put together an office that is essentially focused on gathering an inventory of problems that industry wants solved right now it is it is highly unlikely that the innovator is really bothered about uh, the inventory of problems out there because their initial interest in uh, is in producing uh, science that can with high credibility um so you can create a separate entity that is only going around gathering and that can then find the match between you know typically technology transfer offices in in uh, in most us universities or profit centers right and their only role is in being able to uh, gather you know an institution like iit madras has done it successfully uh, but there are some 17 to 20 uh, industry folks who are creating that bridge that is one institutional structural model that can solve for this so you don't really disturb the innovator they continue to work on what they want but you can constantly nudge them and 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 find the demand on one side where the industry can pull that innovation out right either through licensing or buying out or or even a company can be set up right? that's one the second model um, i think more prevalent in uk is uh, constantly encourage conversations um among people of diverse backgrounds right it could be industry versus scientists in a very um, non defensive uh, environment right it's not like you are constantly looking for something to come out of this just a free exchange of ideas so the innovators themselves learn from others right uh there is somebody from the industry who is telling the innovator if you made this change and if this technology were slightly different you know i would find this very useful right i think in scientific research uh, diversity and conversations if that can be engineered i think it will go a long way in changing the mindset of people and i am fairly certain that however scientific uh, bent of mind most innovators or researchers have like in any population there is always a 5 to 10% category that is different that wants to experiment right so the trick is in finding the 5 to 10 making successes out of them and then the next uh, 30% uh, trying to get inspired by this uh, 10 who have, who have been successful and then once you hit 40 like in any system i think the system will tip because then it has acquired a certain momentum so you can you can create a separate entity that will look at acting as a bridge between industry and their needs and what research is happening uh incentives among institutions and the researchers again go on a, go uh, play a big role uh, so long as they see a potential for this to be commercialized in some cases the motivation could be for the innovation to really see a market need solved in some cases it could be monetary or financial incentives uh, the other one i think an easier one is Uh, just to encourage conversations right just to break the boundaries get people to step out of their places have conversations with folks who are unlike themselves uh, kind of a domain area and have conversations between it's a small group that typically anywhere from 4 hours to sometimes even 2 days curated set of sub topics each uh, block has one topic being discussed and it's i it's mostly in a discovery format you're not supposed to debate 
uh, you can ask clarifying questions, but no debate, no discussion. And the idea is to table, research tables, what they are doing, uh, what the problem the general community is looking at in that area. Large companies look at what are they building right now, what are some of the challenges they're looking at in the next one or two years. Startups come and say what they're innovating, policymakers. So we did that precisely for the purpose, but we, I mean, unfortunately, we don't do it as often as, as we should be doing. There's a catalog exercise, uh, like the problems catalog. But we, we, in spite of trying all that, we also have an engineering group. Uh, we, we create products, or, because sometimes what happens, the, if the researcher or the research group is not interested in taking it forward as a product, there's often a gap, especially in computing, because a lot of it is just algorithms and papers, unlike in, say, materials and such, where the, the, the composition, the molecule, or itself is good enough to productize. In software, the algorithm is like a very generic algorithm that you have to kind of do something with it to solve a problem, often. And, uh, and if the research group is not interested in doing it, and the startup is, or somebody, the one that wants to build is too remote from research, it never happens. So we said, let's build that engineering group in the middle that will work with the researcher, start building the first version of the product, and then see who we can license it to. Even that is so hard. Uh, for instance, like just discovering in some cases, I'll give you an example. We have this lip sync technology done by one of our most prolific professor, Professor Jawahar, you probably know of him. Uh, his work got very, very good attention. It, it was uh, work that uh, got into conference early last year into all the leading uh, computer vision conference. It basically, from the synthesized sound and few videos of the speaker, phonetic, it, it, it creates a phonetic model. From the synthesized sound, the lip is modified to synchronize with the translated. If the person spoke in English. You can now make the person speak in Telugu or Tamil or Kannada with the lip synchronized with the translated text. And the, the speech synthesis also, there's a different product, different work, which will get in that person's voice itself. You recognize, translate, synthesize in that person's voice and then synchronize the lips. Now, we just finding it so hard to find a commercially compelling use case. We found a lot of use cases. Uh, now, do you see, now that itself, in my view, that's all the, the whole product management, right? Uh, some of the best founders, startup founders are fantastic product managers. They, they creatively can connect spot dots and connect dots. Have you seen some some very offbeat products that have come out where like some crazy connection of dots was made? If we have a company in our portfolio called Niramai, which is uh, reasonably well known. They are using thermal imaging for uh, breast cancer screening, huh. right? The actual uh, underlying technology and the patent was uh, developed as a side project uh, when the original founders, uh, Geeta, who is a PhD in, uh, in artificial intelligence from IISC, and Nidhi, who is an engineer and an MBA from IIM Bangalore, right? Uh, they were doing it as a side project uh, while they were working on something else at Xerox Labs. And then uh, they figured out that this is, uh, you know, the founders were passionate enough uh, uh, to uh, solve for this because, you know, breast cancer is one of the most easily detectable cancer and one with the highest, uh, um, you know, uh, detection rate if done earlier on. Hmm. Right? And it is also one of the highest uh, 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 fatality in terms of uh, cancer deaths only because it is detected late. late, right? And the existing modalities are privacy invasive and uh, they, they themselves exposed to, uh, are exposed to radiation. So they themselves contribute uh, to something in countries like Europe. Uh, um, they don't allow you to do a, a mammogram uh, within a gap of two years, hmm. right? That is how behind the existing technology work. So they came out, bought the IP out, and then uh, built this technology out. Um, and now they are, they already got a CE approval for their technology um, and currently applying to FTA. So, so there are, there are uh, several um, examples of how uh, you know, people have gone after right, or taken the existing technology, which independent of its source of development or origin of development, right? Uh, but all of which uh, goes back to the same question. Whom are you building for? Mm. Right. I was recently on the technical advisory committee of one of the leading um, uh, institutes of national eminence in India. right? And they had come up with a plan where they said that uh, we will fund your research mm. uh, on the condition that you need to get an equivalent amount from industry to sponsor. Right. 
Hmm. It's a brilliant scheme because you you provide financial assistance to a professor for them to continue their research by making sure that there is a matching grant uh, that is coming from the industry. You may you are you are confident that uh, you know whom are you building for Welcome is uh, taken care of. The overall construct incentivizes everybody to increase the capital contribution early on so that you can support the research long enough. Hmm. And uh, you can tweak the milestones such that you are able to commit more and more capital after, uh, you know, there is clear evidence that it is moving from proof of science to proof of technology. Hmm. Right. So, I mean, if we think it is important. I think there are enough uh, structural and non-structural mechanisms we can think of to incentivize. Um, but, but you know, for anything to come out into the market in the real world and make a difference, uh, we have to answer the question, whom are you building this for? The earlier we ask this question in the research process, uh, higher will be the yield of uh, successful innovation that are able to change something out in the world. So we, uh, which is the Israeli model, right? I mean, in Israel, it often happens. The technology transfer officers meet with the professors as they're starting their work and, and have a conversation with them saying, look, if you're going to be doing this, why not you do kind of body pay problem statement a little bit because there is this unsolved problem that you may be able to solve. Uh, but I, I don't think uh, anywhere else it happens as well as it does in uh, Israel. But even post fact, uh, after uh, it has happened also, uh, just the uh, like when we go, for instance, uh, in our technology topic, when we go talk to professors and when we talk to them and say, look, tell us what can, what can somebody do with your work? Uh, you've done all this work in this area, what are the areas? First thing they will tell you, like, no, no, my, my work is very, very academic. Uh, there are no use cases for it. And then we have to kind of nudge saying, look, you know what, this work, don't you think it can be used for this? Now, when we started this process three years back, almost almost every single process said, my prof, my work, there can't be any use for it. And uh, today, now at least 20% of the professors reach out to the technology transfer office saying, look, I have this thing, uh, can we look at making a product out of this? So I think we still don't get strong connect. Like you said, discovering the right problem to solve, worth solving, is if that is done, I think in my view, that is 80% of the job done in terms of translation. If you discover the right problem, then things will happen unless the technology is not all there. If technology is there, the right things will happen after that. And that is the most difficult, discovering the right problem. Uh, if there are no entrepreneurs, I mean, you talk about the technology kind of office that could do this, uh, industry and research kind of jointly kind of compiling a set of problems so that researchers can look at it uh, is another way. Uh, are there, is there a third party that could help with this discovery? Uh, what could such a, I mean, is there somebody who can help with this discovery? Uh, because we, like, if See, in, uh, in, uh, in, um, um, you know, th there are different models possible in, in uh, places like Japan, there are uh, venture funds, um, which are funded by where the LPs are corporates, hmm. right? The primary mandate of the venture fund is to look for innovations which is there in the corporate's roadmap which they themselves don't have the capability to uh, build up hmm. right there are specialized venture uh, curation organizations in the us whose only um, competitive advantage is knowing who is working on what in specific areas across research labs and then they do the matchmaking even at Axelor, I think um, uh, we have been thinking about this problem, but now we are confident of uh, taking it upon ourselves. So we launched uh, recently an innovation uh, initiative called Axelor Labs. Hmm. Um, it's uh, still not announced, but we are working with a company where the model is essentially you don't disturb the innovator, right? So for any deep tech startup to be successful, you need a chief scientific officer who's holding the science, building credibility, and uh, who's the primary innovator, right? Now, these people, given their mental makeup, given their uh, prior training, right, they are not comfortable stepping out of research labs. Yes, yes, right? yes. Whereas for that innovation to really come out, you need somebody to drag it out of the lab, take it beyond the proof of science, 
figure out, get uh, exposure, figure validate technology and see how it can be built out into a business, which is the role of a chief business officer. Mm. Right? Now, if you find a good enough innovator, if you have the conviction that this is a, a problem worth solving, and if this innovation comes out, there is enough demand for something like this. Can you really create an institutional model where you can offer the CBO to the innovator and create a company where the innovator is continuing to do what they like doing? The CBO from your side is really, you know, at a, at a, almost like a co-founder uh, who is building the business, right? And take it to a certain level. And after that, you figure out a way to get somebody professional coming in uh, because a lot of risk is uh, taken care of. There is clear validation. There are some uh, early customers. Uh, that is another model. Uh, not easy uh, to implement, uh, but, uh, but we are trying out. It has worked well no. in other markets. Now, the, the quality of researchers in India is definitely as good as anywhere else in the world. So it would be a shame if we don't experiment with these models and see what works and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. no, absolutely. I think uh, we should exchange notes on this. I'll call you later sometime. Uh, so our experiment with our product lab, where we are trying, the, the, the hypothesis was exactly what you said. The innovator doesn't want to do anything other than research, right? They may be okay to participate in something else, but something else is never the priority for their time. Research is what ticks them, research is what drives them, and therefore they want to be doing. So we tried that in our incubator, trying to kind of nurture the process to our research teams to go become innovators. It didn't work after five, six years, we gave up. The product lab is about two, two and a half year experiment. So where we say like, look, we have an engineering group. We will identify the product. We'll work with you. We tell the professor, you just give us an hour a week at most, that's enough. You just need to be an advisor because your technology being, your work being productized. And we find an entrepreneur through the AIR program. So we start building and along the way, find an entrepreneur, license it. Now, it's working okay, but not as well as we would like. So I, uh, I will pick your brains on that and see if there are any suggestions. On the other thing that you mentioned- model, we are also able to provide the initial capital required. That is one big uh, problem uh, taken care of. So right up so to- is, uh, Sorry, so I was going to say, that, that's, that is the other thought we had. Uh, we tried to talk to a few, uh, the, especially the MNA, the corporate uh, technology roadmap that you mentioned. So this came from one of our board members. I mean, Sini Raju, you know Sini Raju. So he said, why can't we put not just, we just pump a couple of uh, crores or even up to a million into a crack team, hire from the best. I mean, like if our campus placement jobs are 30 lakhs above, hire that kind of team, challenge them to build something in 18 months, which is fitting into an M&A technology roadmap of uh, tech companies. Fantastic idea, but it needed that, that tech side of it for different reasons, it didn't take off. We spent some time trying to do it. The other thing also, you're probably aware of the Agni program from the PSA office. So that program also is fantastic. I was saying, look, researcher, they said they will fund a market study. They'll get some of the best minds, uh, their business analysts, to come and put together a business plan for your technology. Find the right use case. Now, the way they went uh, kind of is they assume the researcher is entrepreneur. We told them, because they got to know what we were doing. We had a lot of conversation with the PSA and his team on this. They said, "By we have gone too far. Next round, we will change, but next round never happened. So it didn't work at all. I mean, hey, uh, Ramesh, the thing is this, right? There is a push. Uh, there are two directions from which you can start, right? Uh, you can start from the direction of the market, right? Where the innovation has become mainstream, the business has been built out, right? And on the other side, uh, from the lab, right? Now, from if you start from the lab, it is always a push model, and the inertia is very high. Yes." Right? Very difficult to beat it. Whereas if you start from the other side, which is a pull model, at least you can make sure that you are able to pull uh, where there is some, where the at rope is some, not limp. Yes, where at least you can pivot it to get some, yes. Instead of, correct, correct. Yes, yes. No, I think, uh, no, absolutely. Uh, so See, the, the uh, problem, problem with most research labs, not just in India, world over, is that uh, every researcher uh, has a good golden hammer. They don't looking know the for yeah. looking for a nail, right? Yes. Uh, but the trick is in uh, having any hammer and looking for a golden nail. I, that's very nice you're putting it. I, I, I'm going to borrow this line from you. <laughs> so that's, Talk about uh, hammers that, and nails. Uh, that, that I think is the trick. 
I, I think you 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 I think you said it so clearly, so concisely that golden nail is what nobody is looking for. Uh, we think we have a golden hammer, so we can do something with it. But uh, no, that, that is so true. That is so true. Uh, look, before we take, I think we have a few more minutes before we should take, give some time for questions. Uh, so now we, I mean, I, you touched upon it briefly. There's a the chief scientist, there's a, a CBO type person who's going to be taking uh, also a co-founder. Uh, now, what are some standard equity models at the early stages? Either way, I mean, a researcher trying to become a startup, find a co-founder, or somebody that got the, the golden nail coming in, talking to research group and saying, look, let's jointly do it. And there's some facilitation, right? So there's something facilitating in the middle. Uh, some, uh, what are some of the equity models in the early stages? See, two, three uh, uh, frameworks. Number one is um, you can't kill the goose that is laying the golden egg. So any model in which the innovator is not incentivized, Sometimes it is very easy to uh, look at a curation model where uh, the innovator is almost reduced to an employer with some potential upside, right? So never have a model in which uh, the source of innovation, right, is not incentivized for uh, upside or success. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, um, Technically, you can break this down, right? So a good construct will be to look at any other startup, right? A typical uh, startup with some three founders, right? With complementary skills. Each one of them having about one third in the company, right? Or 50, 20, 25, 25. One of them is on the sales side. One of the, one of them is on the technology side. Uh, the third person is on the product side, right? So one is selling, one is figuring out what needs to be sold and the third person is building. Right? Now, each one of these people have a certain uh, stake in the company and then they need capital to grow. Right? So in the seed round, uh, the investor comes in, uh, gives the capital so that they can validate and move on. Essentially, whether you look at it in venture curation, whether you look at it in the research model, the roles are the same, right? So it's if you're saying you're bringing in a CBO and offering them to the innovator, right? So already you're talking about the innovator being the primary founder and the CBO almost being a, a co-founder, right? Because they are bringing this out. So you can look at an equitable distribution of these two, right? That is the role of the CBO. On top of this, you are bringing in some more capital into the company. Then the investment itself will require a little bit of uh, dilution commensurate with the risk of uh, the investment and the quantum of investment. Right? Well, so, the other, exit... Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, please ask. And I was going to say, like talking about that seed equity, we put some money, like if you take our model at Repriety, uh, we have a... Uh, so we, we do put some money up front, but, um, but it's very small money. We can put maybe like we fund a few engineers. So, you know, the entrepreneur comes, we say like, okay, few engineers will fund because there's no money to pay. And uh, we pay some nominal amount and some maybe five, 10 lakh seed grant. Now, we are, we are very clear. This is not compelling enough. If you want to build a serious product, have yeah. a serious thing, it's just not compelling enough. Are there so, any good uh, sources so for like say 50 lakh funding, for instance, in that stage? So the right way to look at it is not in terms of defining an absolute number, 10 lakh, 25 lakh, 50 lakh or a crore. The most important uh, thing is for the company to move from a certain milestone, right? Let us say you are moving from an idea to a working prototype, right? Proof of science. So funding needs to be thought in terms of milestones, right? If an idea takes, uh, you know, maybe one and a half crores, for it to build out a prototype, a 10 lakh or a 25 lakh is not going to work, right? So if we bring in the discipline of looking at how much funding is required towards what is the next milestone that is important for the startup to move from one stage to next. Sometimes it could be moving from an idea to a working prototype. Sometimes it could be a working prototype that would actually be piloted in some real life context, right? That's the important number. And that number varies dramatically across business models. True, true. If you have a voice recognition software, right? 
it is not like uh, you will need a lot of capital to move to a working pilot even in a commercial context whereas if you are building out a sensor that has to work uh, in an industrial context right um, with proof of no sparking whatsoever right uh, which requires uh, some 10 uh, uh, tests right and some certifications it's not an easy product to build right unless they have a visibility of 3 to 5 crore over a 12 month period that product is not going to get built so a lot of uh, educational institutions in india think in terms of this 25 lakh 50 lakh right i think the discipline to bring in is for a particular kind of startup what is the right next milestone to get there what is the minimum capital they will need some cases it would be 25 some cases it could be 50 some cases it could be 2 crores but you can't apply a 50 lakh number across the board just true, just because the model uh, you know allows for only that true 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 i mean gm 50 not available sadly right uh, you're right i mean the, i think the outcome from this exercise should be like a at least a pilot ready product that you understood use cases and for one use case you built it and it's at least a pilot ready if not a customer uh, revenue ready at least a pilot ready version is what we should be looking at and uh, and if they don't have the challenges that you mentioned in terms of a hardware certification testing and such if it is like say look at software based solutions so it may not need like a whole lot of money but may still need somewhere in the 25 to 50 lakh range to get to that stage even uh, factoring the sweat equity of the founders uh, now what are some of the sources of funds uh, for that level because vc funds are not there at that stage right uh, to build the first pilot ready prototype from research there are no vc funds government funds There's are there a lot of small. lot of money available with corporates this matching grant is an excellent model to build on but they don't they don't fund innovation see matching grant like once in dst all the government funding agencies these days insist on no 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 i am talking about i am talking about corporates but they they have their own very narrow at least the ones i am aware of they where there is some money available it's very narrow problem scope the area That they so are good one to give good one to support no at least you have true, solved true. for the customer. problem of uh, problem of uh, you know whom are you building for but even those maybe I should talk to you again but I, they don't seem too many even those are very very small in number uh, if you look at the possibilities is probably much more than uh, the uh, the number of uh, corporates that are willing to do this uh, but yes that is one good source uh we're trying to see what other sources can be like i said i think i need to understand more of the actual labs and see uh, is that something that that can be scaled we would love to leverage that for sure in some of what we are doing uh but that's a good model i think that is good that you're doing it because like you've been in this space long enough and i think you see possibilities from research works that is not coming out today just because there's nobody doing it or there's no right structure to do it and you're trying to do, bring that in through the actual labs i think we need more of those Yeah. I, I think uh, I think uh, institutions uh, can um, can partner uh, with even uh, global bodies. There are a number of grant making bodies. There are MNC corporates. There are VC funds uh, outside of India, uh, in which the corporates are the LPs. So so some bit of investor outreach beyond India as well may not be a bad idea if the technology is something that has global relevance. Hmm. I think uh, yeah, that's a channel. I don't think it's explored much. I mean, like in Hyderabad, uh, in the medical side, uh, you're probably aware of Rich. So that's an initiative where uh, Ajit Sangnekar is the director general for that. So they are trying in the life sciences space, specifically medical, but broadly life sciences, including agri and such, uh, trying to connect the research in because Hyderabad has this dense number of super high quality research institutions like CCMB, IACT, the many institutions in the life sciences and agri space. So they're trying to connect that with corporates and with they are playing that middle, that matchmaking, trying to find the linking the golden hammer to the golden nails. Find both. Uh, both are difficult. If you talk to Ajit sir, you'll he will tell both are difficult. Uh, you can't find the golden hammer and you definitely cannot find the golden nail. Uh, but um, I think we need more such models. I know IIT Madras is trying uh, some of it. IIT Delhi has some success with their fit, uh, but very few and far in. I mean, far uh, few and far in between. So hopefully in the coming years we will see more of it. Uh, so with that, I would like to open up for questions. Uh, so uh, so Vanya, how are we getting the questions? Uh, so we'll just ask everybody to put it on chat, or they can unmute themselves and uh, ask away. 
Yes, we have about 10, 12 minutes. Uh, yes. So any questions for VG or any comments also if somebody has some experiences relevant to the, uh, the whole uh, deep tech innovation. Okay, while the, uh, the the questions come up now, so so we we touched briefly on the founders at least the co-founders, um, but even in the early stages you need to hire a few uh, like engineers and such into the teams. So what is a, a good composition? Like I mean, you need to get the techies. If you're a software product, you need to get the software. Like you said, if you're a speech product, you need to get the speech kind of engineers. Uh, so you need to get the engineers anyway, but I see a lot of the very early stage teams focusing completely on building the product. Are there other things they should be aware of, even if not as full-time team members, even in the very early stages, what, what would be a good team composition, even if it includes advisors and part-time team members? I think some of the startups that have been successful with whom I have worked have done an excellent job of uh, hiring interns. Hmm. Right? Um, because it is possible for you to get them to work on very narrow areas. And if they really do a good job, uh, then it can convert into a full-time opportunity. Hmm. And find, finding a person in a narrow area with the kind of passion that they need to bring in is not a trivial problem for founders. Yes, yes, yes. So some of, some of the startups that have really done well on building teams uh, start at the intern level. And they build talent organically. Hmm. Which also means that you have to start on your talent acquisition journey almost two years ahead. But that is, a, that is something that is always paid dividends hmm. because the risk is low. Um, you, can, uh, you can give something of value to the person. The, it is not very expensive. Hmm. Right? Hmm. Um, I, I, know, uh, I know a company that is hitting Series A, right? uh, which has almost one third of its uh, team uh, as uh, intern talent. Hmm. But they have perfected that model. And today, if they have to scale, uh, all that they have to do is to make offers to these people. Mm -hmm. That's number one. The second thing is, uh, I think one of the founders has to be out there selling mm -hmm. or talking to customers. I think uh, in most uh, deep tech startups, uh, that is something that is a huge blind spot for founders. But on the other hand, wherever there is one of the founding team members who is doing this, the success rate of the startup is very high. True, very true. I think like uh, I think that's very whether you want to hire people or you want to discover some use cases or you want to discover prospects, investors, mentors, anybody. You're right. They should be out there. One of the founders has to be out there talking, uh, and that's also almost always uh, common in most successful startups. I mean, finding a customer, finding an investor is not somebody else's job. It is a founder's job. Yes, and yes. finding a customer and finding an investor is not a part-time job. It's a full-time job. So we are talking about one founder's full-time job being devoted to one of these two areas. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, unless that happens, the outcomes are far from Yes, technology cannot sell itself, mostly. Sometimes, yes, rarely, but mostly it can never sell itself. So it's, it's, it's difficult to find technology that's like gold, which doesn't need to be sold. Yes. <laughs> like I always say, like if you can solve hunger and poverty in a commercially viable way, there you go. You don't need to do much. <laughs> but those are not easy. I mean, those are not easy to solve at all. So most solutions are not that kind of solution. So you have to sell. So so any any questions? We can just pause for a bit. Yeah. Hello. 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 Yes, sir. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening, all. Uh, so, I have a, like, we are working on uh, deep tech startups, sir. So, during our journey, we met a couple of uh, investors like like Ratnakar from Hyderabad in and all. So, one thing commonly coming up over here is like we we are finding lot many competitors in similar space. So, it is a very when you look at the global aspect, uh, the product what we are working on will be a very niche product. So in that situation, either we look at complete market focus or we look at competitors and also see that how that particularly works. Hey, Sumed, I missed the last part of your question. Come again. If it is a niche uh, product, uh, what, yeah. what was your question? Do we have to look from mar market perspective and proceed with the market 
or do we have to also look what competitors are doing and understand and then change our business model accordingly uh sumit the answer lies in if you if you want to build out uh, an innovation that has uh, really large impact out in the world and hence as a consequence you are looking at building a large enough business then uh, you have to find as many strong use cases or applications as possible now whether these applications and use cases come from your competitors they whether they come from uh, your customers whether they come from your go to market partners doesn't really matter and and definitely to the other point that you made on competitors i mean if there are enough competitors already and you are going to be the n plus 1 to 1 there may not be enough value so in what you are trying to do you have to make sure there's a very good competitive positioning maybe a segment and such okay okay so so that is the 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 other uh, aspect that yes, sorry to me yes to me don't the reply chahiye i am not okay i think you are wrong uh ramesh uh, good evening ramesh sir this is deepak baguna Sir, uh, sir, how are you, sir? Uh, the session is awesome, sir. And hello, Vijay, v- sir. Uh, sir, I want to mention one thing about my research project, which I had done in M M Tech in 2020. So it it is on the VLSI uh, design, like very large integrated circuit. So I have designed a high voltage. uh lateral power mosfet which is used as a uh, as a switching device uh, in the uh, in the mobile communication or in the dc controllers and etc so sir as uh, a research which i have i have done i should say that your research is going to be focused on i trip i i would find a way out to patent it cause um uh, i searched a lot of uh, various research uh, articles it is the latest technology on which i have worked and uh, i also searched about the in the market whether the device that i have designed uh, exists in uh, exists at that uh, category or not like i have used the tench technology so the the question deepak is so the question, question is uh, like i am a, i'm a, i was a student and i have done research on this topic so sir uh, i need to get a patent and i need to get a patent and at the international level so that my innovation is not copied also i want to start a startup so i my question specifically is about that with one product which is commercially viable can we uh, go for a startup and it is not a uh, it it's the latest technology in which i have researched uh, companies like fairchild semiconductor have designed uh, uh, like uh, tench technology mosfet electronic device uh, which which has a voltage rating of like breakdown voltage has one so i think deepak i think we understand the question we we'll let vg comment on it yeah, yeah. just last point then uh, the latest uh, device which is available in the market in that technology mosfet technology high voltage mosfet technology is around 150 volt and i have just increased that voltage from 150 to 180 to volt also i have deepak deepak just just in the interest of time you know you should you should engage with triple it h and uh, the incubator that because institutions like this and the incubators there are essentially mandated with uh, supporting startups like yours and helping you answer this question as well yes yes uh, please do reach out deepak uh, you can reach out to me or just uh, anybody in the incubator society uh, and we should talk um, but i think at some level vg this is a uh, i see a lot of um, spt if it's a researcher that wanting to be entrepreneur they are little too worried about their patents and such and um, while it's important See, i i i always uh, i i always tell uh, startup founders you can't keep your product uh, uh, you know a secret from your customers yes right so you know the value of ip is in being able to give some proprietary value to the research that you have done 
and give it that kind of value for a for a, a reasonable period of time but the applications of that uh, and finding those applications is still your responsibility right uh, you know just claiming that uh, this is too important an ip for me to really start working on commercial application then that just means that you don't have your heart uh, in building out a venture no absolutely i think that's what they, they get little i mean yes the researchers the research work is very central and crucial uh, but if you don't have a problem that it can address no point you're trying to patent so that uh, connect is often missing uh, but yeah but yes we will so i think we have come we just have a minute left so vijay thank you so much it's always no a problem. pleasure i mean uh, like you're sorry professor ramesh i'm sorry i'm so sorry before uh, we even close out I, i for the benefit of everybody i just had a question and i just wanted you to you know address it in a minute uh, so uh, for the benefit of all i you know i do know myself that um, how cie is helping you know deep tech startups uh, so i would just like you to you know uh, throw some light on the avishkar program and uh, just a broader view on it and uh, and yeah and then we can close Sure, Vanya. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, the Avishkar program is for early stage startups uh, that are pre-revenue, have a product, uh, and they already know what they're trying to do and why. Meaning, what market use case are they going after? And uh, so, and they're deep technology startup. We take them into a six-month program. So where we get uh, the strategy mentoring, business, which is towards their first uh, or early customers, mentoring, and also the technology research mentoring. So the three tracks of mentoring. so we take the early stage startups and get them towards early revenue so that's the uh, the crux of the program uh, for deep tech startups that are using technology where some guidance and advice from a research group will help uh, so there's other thing we look for when we pick the startups up, apart from of course that they're going after a compelling market uh, need uh, there is up to 40 lakhs of seed investment that goes into these startups uh, apart from the mentoring and such mm-hmm. so this has been running for the last uh, four and a half years now we take about three cohorts every year and uh, so we just the call for the next cohort is out a couple of weeks back so anybody a deep tech startup in the early stages uh, pre revenue uh, are most welcome to uh, apply uh, but most of what we were discussing today is little earlier than that right a researcher i mean avishkar is still somebody where that is they have already got a first version of the product maybe not market ready yet and they were already kind of already on a path towards a market ready uh, product if you look at researchers trying to productize uh, like if you take deepak's um, uh, example i think uh, that is before avishkar but they should reach out also like bg rightly said academic incubators are best position to guide and help in that very very early stages where you are even thinking of okay this may work and, and it's a good product the research work is done already uh, so it's a fantastic uh, stage to have the college but the conversation is very important so they should be talking to academic incubators even in that stage So maybe Ramesh, it's a, it's a, it's, maybe Ramesh, it's a good idea for you to have some kind of an open house format, uh, just on this question, right? Can my technology become yes. a company, right? Uh, that yes. will uh, uh, that. We, I think we should do that. Uh, Anubhav, let's uh, organize for that separately. I know you're planning a couple of other uh, around Swasti or Navishka. We should do that. Uh, we'll do that, BJ. I think it's uh, just to help. We have an information session sometimes. I, I think we should plan one uh, this time. Uh, we do the boot camps also, BJ. I'm not sure if you are aware. We do the idea validation boot camp where somebody has an idea. Of course, unfortunately, there are not so many that come with deep tech ideas. But every time we do, if there are about eight to ten startups, one or two maybe, uh, not two, one maybe that comes from research. Uh, anybody with an idea, thinking of a startup, can come to the boot camp. and uh, it's a two day boot camp where uh, mentor led and all the case studies are their own ideas so they ask to do the worksheet and the mentor looks at what they have done and then gives feedback to the whole batch uh, but the i think this information session is a good one we will do that so viji thank you so much we've just gone a minute two minutes over time uh, thanks for joining us always a pleasure talking to you viji and uh, i hope uh, the current phase kind of fades away and then we can start out just begin to plan my travel to bangalore I thought okay in April I will go so, and so then like uh, yes so <laughs> and uh, no I have to go in February March I said okay April I will go to Bangalore and start my travel Delhi and Bangalore are on my list but unfortunately it looks like another few months uh, we'll meet sometime uh, it's always pleasure such a rich uh, set of experiences I mean you are is one of those uh, few super enthusiastic investors that stays in touch with the ecosystem go much beyond your portfolio uh, it's always a pleasure talking to you BG uh, thank you thank you so much.
Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye. thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bye. thank you, everyone. Thank you, VG. Thank you, Ramesh. So I hope uh, you know everybody uh, got some insights uh, from the session. I definitely I did. Uh, so uh, guys, I mean, uh, I have also dropped a link uh, for uh, the Avishkar uh, program. Please do check it out. Um, it'll be very helpful for all the deep tech startups. Um, other than that, also, if you have any uh, challenges that you're facing from for your startups, please uh, feel free to reach out to Head Start as well. Um, thank you for joining in, and uh, you know, please keep safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thanks, Anubhav. Thanks, Pragya.